In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into the lore behind one of the more prominent and nuanced Hindu demons in Shin Rigami Tensei, Vishnu. Coming away from this video, I want you to understand the lore and the mythological impacts Vishnu has contributed, as well as their impact to the Shin Rigami Tensei franchise. I'll take a look regarding their designs, appearances, and movesets to see how they stack up against Hindu lore. Let's go ahead and get into it. Vishnu is one of the primary deities in the Hindu pantheon. He's called the Preserver, and is known for a kindly demeanor and genuine interest in the welfare of humanity. In the Hindu religion, Vishnu the Preserver is one of the three principal deities of the Trimurti, also known as the Hindu male triad, along with Brahma the Creator and Shiva the Destroyer. As the Preserver, Vishnu maintains balance within the world, and at the end of our current aeon, he will appear as his final avatar, Kalki, and judge whether mortals have been good or evil. After this, the universe will end and creation will start anew. He is depicted with up to four arms, blue skin, holding a chakra wheel, a lotus flower, a mace, and a conch, and rides on the back of Garuda. He also sleeps on the back of the great Naga named Ananta. Vishnu's main function is to send out avatars to right the world's wrongs, but in the Vaishnava traditions, Vishnu reigns supreme as creator, preserver, and destroyer. All other gods are merely emanations of his godhead. As a preserver god, Vishnu keeps the cosmos running smoothly, ensuring that everyone and everything is in its proper place. He sends out his avatars to Earth in order to restore Dharma, the righteous order of the universe whenever it's threatened. Often this threat takes the form of some demon or titan who tries to overthrow the will of the gods. Famous examples of Vishnu's avatars include Rama and Krishna, heroic figures of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata who are worshipped in their own right. Other avatars serve as primordial creators and shapers of the world, such as the bear avatar Imusha, who dredges up the Earth from the cosmic ocean and divides it into continents. Now that I've given you a high-level overview on Vishnu, let's examine his etymology, his family, and the avatars of Vishnu. Then, we'll learn about his top three temples in order of significance, and then proceeding to Vishnu's Megatzen impact. According to Monier Williams, the name Vishnu probably derives from the Sanskrit root vis, meaning to work, perform, rule, subdue. Although he renders Vishnu as a worker, he acknowledges the common translation of the name as the all-pervader perhaps in reference to the widespread adjective Vishva, meaning all-pervader or omnipresent, is ascribed to Vishnu in the Vishnu Sahasranama. According to Vaishnava traditions of Hinduism, Vishnu stands as the supreme god and is self-born without a mother or a father. This feature is shared with Shiva in the Shivati traditions. Vishnu's wife is Lakshmi, goddess of fortune, prosperity, and wealth. So now that we've covered his family, let's examine his avatars, as this is a very complex and nuanced subject in and of itself. Vishnu is known for his frequent use of avatars in his quest to restore the cosmic order. The number of avatars varies between 10, 12, and 22. The 10 most popular will be detailed in this video. They run the full spectrum of the cosmic timeline, appearing at the creation of the Earth as well as the end of the current cosmic cycle. The typical order in which the avatars appear shows the development from animal to human. The first three avatars are varying types of aquatic or semi-aquatic animals, followed by the Narasinga, literally meaning the man-lion, the rest are all human male. Now let's learn about the first avatar, Matsayu the fish. Long ago, a righteous king named Manu performed great austerities for millions of years. In return, the creator god Brahma granted him a blessing. Rather than asking for invincibility, a common wish among demons, his request was far more selfless. He bowed respectfully and said, I only want one thing from you, the ultimate boon. Make me the protector of all standing and moving creatures when the dissolution happens. It was not long before the need for his protection grew dire. As the king made water offerings to the ancestors, a single small fish fell into his hands. Only a day after, had he taken the fish into his care, it grew out and cried for a bigger container. After three days, the new bowl was too small for the fish. Soon it outgrew well, and even a pond. Now a league in length, they cried out, Save me, save me, excellent king. But the river Ganges itself could not contain its bulk, and soon the entire ocean was nothing more than a pool in comparison. Now at the end of his wits, Manu saw the fish for who he really was, Vishnu, now recognized. Vishnu spoke in the form of the fish, and told Manu that the dissolution of the world, a great flood would wash away all things. But the gods had crafted a boat, and Manu was to gather all creatures, those born from eggs, plants, and sweat, as well as born living, and bring them aboard. Manu was then to fasten the boat onto the fish's horn. Leading up to the dissolution of the world, a hundred year famine broke out, followed by searing heat and solar flares. Everything burned. Seven clouds burst open and flooded the world, and all the seas merged into one violent ocean. Only Manu, and a handful of gods, Soma, Surya, Brahma, and Vishnu, and the seer, Markandeya, survived. Throughout all this ruin, Manu gathered the world's plants and animals onto his boat. 
Once they were all safely aboard, Vishnu guided the boat and told Manu the secrets of the cosmos and creation of the world. At the beginning of the new age, the Krita age, Manu reigned as lord of all things on earth. Now let's examine our next avatar, Kirma the Tortoise. When Vishnu assumed the form of Kirma the Tortoise, his goal was not to slay a demon or to right a wrong. Instead, he wanted to help the gods achieve immortality by churning the cosmic ocean. In short, the gods and demons decided to set aside their differences and work together in order to create Amrita, the nectar of immortality. To do so, they needed to churn the cosmic ocean just as you would churn milk in order to make butter. But no ordinary churning tools would do this. For this, they uprooted the great mountain Mandara, with all of its trees, herbs, and animals, and plunged it into the ocean. They then wrapped the giant snake Wasuki around the mountain, with the gods taking one end and the demons the other, and began to twist the mountain and stir the ocean. Their task was an arduous one, for the mountain's great size meant that it would not stay afloat. To remedy this problem, Vishnu took the form of Kirma the tortoise and supported the mountain with his great shell. The gods and demons were then able to complete their task and create the sacred Amrita. Now, let's discuss the next important lore story, Imbusha the boar. Long ago, Vishnu took the form of a boar, variously named Imbusha, Viraha, and Parajapati, the first avatar that was not purely aquatic. His great deed was one of creation, when all the world was still just an ocean, he discovered the earth underneath the waters in the underground regions of hell. The earth goddess saluted him reverently and implored him to raise her up, as he had in earlier ages when he took on the avatars of a fish and a tortoise. According to the Vishnu Purana, she raised him as a sole creator, preserver, and destroyer of the world, and revealed that he variously takes the forms of Brahma, traditionally known as the creator god, Vishnu, the preserver god, and Rudra, another name for Shiva, the destroyer god. Vishnu, as Imusha the boar, raised up the earth with his tusks and placed it carefully on top of the water and spread it in all directions so that it grew from the size of a single hand span to the great mass it is now. Because the earth was so stretched, it was able to float on the water. For this reason, the earth is called the Extended One. Vishnu, as Imusha, then took hold of the earth, raised up mountains, and carved out valleys. Since the world has been divided into seven continents in earlier cosmic ages, he recreated these continents and formed divisions between the earth, heavens, hells, and ether. Imusha later slew the dragon Hiranyakasha, sparking hatred between Vishnu and Hiranyakasha's brother Hiran Yakashiku. Now, let's examine Narasinga the Man Lion. Vishnu took the form of Narasinga, literally meaning Man Lion, in order to slay the demon Hiranyakapishu. The demon had once performed a great deal of austerities, and in return granted him a blessing, invincibility. He could not be slain by god, man, or beast on the ground or in the sky. With his invulnerability, he fought the gods and re-established demons as rulers of the cosmos. Moreover, he banished the gods and took for himself whatever sacrifices or ritual offerings were meant for his foes. Hiranyakapishu harbored a bitter grudge against Vishnu, for his Vishnu in the avatar of Bor, who had slain his brother, Hiran Yakasha, many ages past. But his son, Prahlada, was a devout worshipper of Vishnu and openly praised the god as being even greater than his father. Eventually, Hiran Yakapishu grew so angry at his son's worship that he tried to kill him several times. But each time, Prahlada's devotion and Vishnu himself saved him from certain death. When Hiran Yakapishu sent his servants to kill his son, their weapons had no effect. When snakes bit Prahlada on every inch of his body, he didn't feel any pain. Elephant's tusks even came back blunted when they tried to gore him. By this point, Hiranyakapishu had reached his wit's end and asked his son why Vishnu was not visible in a pillar in his grand hall if the god was everywhere at all times. He then rose and struck the pillar, and to his shock, the god did appear. Narasinka, the man lion avatar, burst out of the pillar and enacted his final brutal revenge on the demon for defeating the gods. He ripped Hiranyakapishu's chest open with his claws. Because Narasinka was neither man, nor beast, nor god, he was able to slay the demon despite seeming invulnerable. Moreover, as he ravaged Hiranyakapishu, Vishnu kept the demons on his thighs so that he was neither on the ground nor in the sky. Now that we've concluded this lore piece, let's examine Vimana and the Three Strides. One of the most important tales of Vishnu goes back to the Vedic times and deals with the never-ending tug-of-war between the gods and demons for control of the cosmos. The story appears variously in the Rig Veda and the Shatapatha Brahmana. The Vedic concept of creation is based on measuring out and dividing the elements theme seen earlier when Vishnu, as a boar, spread out the earth and divided it into continents. Later Hindu literature, including the Shatapatha Brahmana and the Vayu Purana, expands on this event and has Vishnu taking three strides in the form of Vamana the dwarf. During the Tetra Age long ago, the demons got the upper hand against the gods, and the demon king Baldi reigned supreme over the cosmos. To restore the god's place, Vishnu's avatar appeared, diminutive and unintimidating, with short arms and legs. He started into Bali's court while the demons were performing a sacrifice and requested a blessing. 
Bali accepted this request, not thinking much of the short Vahamana, but his amusement turned to dread as a seemingly insignificant dwarf grew to monstrous size. But the dwarf, the lord, stepped over the heaven, the sky, and the earth, this whole universe, in three strides. And with those three strides, he assumed control of the cosmos and banished Bali and all the demons with him to hell, routing them in all directions. With the cosmos in the hands of the gods, Vishnu appointed Indra as their king. The version in the Shatapatha Brahmana also depicts Vishnu's incredible expansion, but does away with the three strides. In this version, the demons were dividing the cosmos among themselves and measuring distances with the hides of the oxen. The gods gathered among them to ask for their own share and placed Vishnu, again as a dwarf, on an altar for their sacrifice. Seeing the short god, Bali arrogantly proclaimed that the gods could only have as much as Vishnu could rest on. In response, the clever gods worshipped Vishnu and enclosed him in each direction with a different poetic meter. The Gatra meter in the south, the Trishtum in the west, the Jagti meter in the north, and Agni, the god of fire himself, in the east. After worshipping him until they were exhausted, the gods soon controlled the cosmos. As we know, Vishnu's avatars usually descend to earth to right a wrong brought about by a powerful demon. Rama slays Ravana, Narasinga slays Hiranyakapishu, Bamana takes his three strides and wrestles control of the cosmos from the demon king Bali, and so forth. In contrast, Parashurama, otherwise known as an axe bearing Rama, comes to earth to humble the Katshurai warrior caste for their mistreatment of the Brahmins. At one time, King Arjuna honored and gave sacrifices to Dattaraya, a divine sage. In return, he was granted invincibility, a thousand arms, wealth, fame, strength, and a mastery of yoga. Meanwhile, Hirashirama was born into the family of the pious Raman Jabinagi and his wife Renuka. Jabinagi had little of value except for an excellent sacrificial cow. His wealth consisted of a vast amount of tapas, or asceticism that he had accumulated over the years from a life of sacrifice. One day, the cat Shiraya king went out hunting with his army, servants, and attendants and came across Jabinagi's hut. The Brahmin graciously received the king and his men and served them all milk, butter, and other forms of dairy from a sacrificial cow. But the king, upon seeing the cow, judged its worth to be greater than all of his worldly wealth. Consumed with greed, he seized the animal and led it back to his capital city. Luckily for the king, Parashurama had been away during his stay, but when the Brahmin's son returned and learned of what had happened, he resolved to get his father's cow back no matter the price. Seizing his bow and his axe, he had set off. Arjuna the king returned to his city just in time to find Parashurama waiting for him, his terrible axe in hand. Vishnu's avatar slew the king's army, and then and there hacking away not only at the men, but also at the horses, the chariots, and the elephants. Soon, only Arjuna was left, but the king was not to be trifled with, for he still had a mighty blessing and a thousand arms. With these thousand arms, he let loose hundreds of arrows at once at Parashurama, but it was no use. He fell as easily as the rest of his army. For a time, Parashurama and his family prospered with the return of the cow, but Arjuna's sons still lived. Though they had fled in terror of Parashurama's onslaught, they now wanted revenge for the death of their father, sneaking into Javanagi's hut while Parashurama was away. They then slew the Brahmin, thus continuing the cycle of hatred and revenge. In response, Parashurama broadened his hatred to all the members of the Katshuraya caste. He returned to the city once more, slew all the Katshurayas with this terrible battle axe, and made a mountain of their heads in the city center. In his rage, he wiped out the warrior caste not just once but twenty-one times, and filled nine lengths in Samantapaka with their blood. In the end, Parashurama was able to bring back his father. He rejoined Javanagi's head to the body and gave sacrifices to himself, for he was none other than Vishnu's avatar. He also bathed in the Saraswati River to cleanse himself of all guilt and sin. Javanagi then rose once more and eventually became a great sage. In the story of Rama, Vishnu descends to earth and is born as Rama in order to slay the demon Ravana and restore Dharma. Rama is the son of Dasharatha, the husband of Sita, and the hero of the epic poem, the Ramayana. Now let's talk about one of the more popular avatars, Krishna. Perhaps the most popular avatar of Vishnu, Krishna looms large over the epic poem of the Mahabharata and plays a central role in the Bhagavad Gita. Like Rama, Krishna is the divine hero prince. Unlike most other avatars, he however acts as a trickster figure who steals butter and plays pranks, especially during his youth. Now, I could go more into this, but I was thinking about doing Krishna as a whole other topic for another video. So let's go into the next key avatar, the Buddha. 
At one time, the war between the Devas and the Daityas raged in favor of the demons, and the gods were driven back from their strongholds. They reasoned that the demons owed their skill in battle solely to their righteous adherence to the Vedas and the sacrifices they drew power from. Vishnu's solution to their prayers was to emanate a magical illusion from his body in the shape of an ascetic bald, naked, and carrying around peacock feathers who he named the Buddha. This naked ascetic, Vishnu said, will walk among the demons and give them false teachings. Being thus deluded, the demons will fall from the righteous path of the Vedas and Brahmins and be fair game for slaughter. This plan was a rousing success for the magical illusion and convinced many of the demons to abandon the Vedas, give up sacrificing animals, and take up Buddhism, Jainism, and other ascetic traditions. In the battles that followed, the demons suffered terrible defeats without the protection provided by sacrificing and honoring the Brahmins. This penultimate avatar differs from the rest in that Vishnu is not born as a mortal, unlike Rama and Krishna for example. Instead, the Buddha is strictly a magical delusion, otherwise known as a Maya Moha, summoned by Vishnu's magic. In this way, Vishnu has uncharacteristically subverted his own grand purpose of restoring the righteous order of the universe. Vishnu's final avatar, Kalkin, has yet to arrive. According to the Vishnu Purana, Vishnu will appear at the end of the present Kali Age when humanity has degenerated from its current state. In that distant time, people will live mostly in mountainous areas, wear clothes made from bark, and live on honey, flowers, fruits, and vegetables. Kalkin will be born in the village of Shambhala to the Brahmin Vishnu Vashis. With unlimited power and marital might, Kalkin is predicted to wipe out the barbarians and non-Hindus and re-establish all things in their proper order. When the minds of all people are thus restored and no longer degenerate, those who were left will serve as seeds for future generations. The cycle of existence will then reset, beginning again in the Krita Age. Wendy Doniger claims that the passage detailing Kalkin's birth was written around the first few centuries, a time when millennial ideas were rampant in Europe, and when Scythians, Parthians, and other nomadic peoples swept through northwestern India and established kingdoms there. Anxiety about nomadic migrations is reflected in Kalkin's supposed purpose of wiping out barbarians and non-Hindus, as many of the nomadic peoples and Indo-Greeks before them were followers of Buddhism. As one of the most popular gods, Vishnu has numerous temples throughout South and Southeast Asia. Given the sheer number of avatars and different forms that Vishnu assumes, these temples are dedicated to a wide variety of figures, but all can be considered Vaishnava. Let's examine the top three temples associated to Vishnu. Let's start with the Badrinath Temple. The temple is also one of the 108 Divya Desmas dedicated to Vishnu, who is worshipped as Badrinath also known as Holy Shrines for the Vaishnavites. The temple is located in the Garwal Hill Tracks in the Kamali District along the banks of the Alakanda River. It is also one of the most visited pilgrimage sites in India. According to Hindu legend, the god Vishnu sat in meditation at this place. During his meditation, Vishnu was unaware of cold weather. Lakshmi, his consort, protected him in the form of the Badri tree. Pleased by the devotion of Lakshmi, Vishnu named this place Badrika Ashram. According to Atkinson, the place used to be a Jujubee forest, which is not found there today. Vishnu, in the form of Badrinath, is depicted in the temple sitting in the Padmasana posture. According to legend, Vishnu was chastised by sage Naranda, who saw Vishnu's consort, Lakshmi, massaging his feet. Vishnu went to Badrinath to perform austerity, meditating for a long time in Padmasana. Now, let's talk about arguably the second most significant Vishnu temple, Ranganaswami. It is the most illustrious Vaishnava temple in South India, rich in legend and history. The temple has played an important role in Vaishnavism history, starting with the 11th century career of Ramanuja and his predecessors, Nathamuni and Yamunachara. Its location, on an island between Kaladam and Kaveri rivers, has rendered it vulnerable to flooding, as well as rampaging of invading armies, who repeatedly commandeered the site for military encampments. The temple was looted and destroyed by the Delhi Sultanate armies in a broad plunder raid on various cities in the Pandyan Kingdom in the early 14th century. The temple was rebuilt in the late 14th century, the site fortified and expanded with many more guprams in the 16th and 17th centuries. It was also one of the hubs of the early Bhakti movement with a devotional singing and dance tradition, but this tradition stopped during the 14th century and was revived in a limited way much later. The Padmanam Baswani Temple has been referred to in the only recorded Sangam period of literature several times. Many conventional historians and scholars are of the opinion that one of the names that the temple had, which was often called the Golden Temple, clearly was in cognizance of the fact that the temple was already unimaginably wealthy by that point. Many pieces of Sangam Tamil literature and poetry, as well as later works of the 9th century Tamil poet saints like Nemalwar, refer to the temple and the city as having walls of pure gold. 
At some places, both the temple and the entire city are often eulogized as being made of pure gold, and the temple as heaven. The temple is one of the 108 principal Debya Desmas, or holy abodes, in Vaishnavism, according to existing Tamil hymns from the 7th and 8th centuries, and is glorified by the Divya Prabhupada. The Divya Prabhupada glorifies his shrine as being one of the 13 Devya Desma in the Mali Nadu. The 8th century Tamil poet Elvar Nemalvar sang the glories of the Padmanabha. It is believed that Parasurama purified and venerated the idol of Sri Padwanaswami in the Devapara Yuga. Parasurama entrusted the administration of the temple with seven body families. King Vikrama Vanshi, otherwise known as Vinad, was directed by Parasurama to do protection of the temple. Parasurama gave the tantrum of the temple to Nambu Pirad. This legend is narrated in detail in the Kerala Mahathmyam, which forms in part of the Brahmanda Puranam. So now that we've covered the essentials of Vishnu's Hindu lore and his temples, let's now examine the impact of the Shin Megami Tensei franchise. It is no surprise that a god as prominent and as powerful as Vishnu has seen himself in a multitude of Shin Megami Tensei games. For this section of the video, I will not be going over every single entry, but rather the games where I can provide more detail than just demon fusions, as that would apply to so many games. As applicable, I will also speak on design choices by Atlas pertaining to that specific game. As a fair warning, there will be spoilers ahead if you haven't already played these games. In Shin Megami Tensei, the game where it all started, Vishnu will join the party to defeat his old arch-rival Ravana if the protagonist is following the path of law. If you are neutral or chaos, Vishnu will attack them in the Tokyo Garvin office. After being defeated, he laments that he was defeated not by Ravana or a god, but by humans. I should also note that Vishnu cannot be used in any fusions in this game. Another point to make regarding his design is it appears Kaneko drew his influence on the SMT1 design from this picture of Krishna, which is one of his avatars. In Shin Megami Tensei Imagine, Vishnu appears as a powerful event boss, spawning with Narasimha and Garuda. Acquiring his in-game plugin requires achieving the highest monthly score within the Ultimate Battle Coliseum and completing the Champion course. He can also be fused by a special double fusion of Ananta and Garuda in this game. In Apocalypse, Vishnu's avatar Krishna will come into play. Krishna interrupts the war between the forces of Law and Chaos as a representative and the main leader of the Divine Powers. He has a messiah complex and an extremely patronizing view of humans, seeing them as expendable in his goal of universal salvation, and isn't very far from manipulating his adversaries to achieve his objectives. Much like Dagda though, his final goal is to put an end to YHVH's manipulation and false flag war so that he and his gods can create a new world. Initially, he is sealed within an arc in Kando no Yoshiro in Tokyo, but Odin manipulates Nanashi and Asahi with a little help from Dagda if Nanashi attempts to negate Odin's manipulations into freeing him. He immediately sets out to convince Flynn to join them as his Kalki, or his own version of a god slayer. Flynn was then kidnapped by Krishna, and the one that Nanashi and his cohorts met for the majority of the game was actually Shesha. After Nanashi takes down both Merkava and Lucifer, he will enact his plan to supplant YHVH as the creator, permanently claiming the new universe for polytheism, as well as getting a step ahead of Dagda. Shesha will kill all the hunters in celebration, and reveal himself to actually be impersonating Flynn. After devouring Asahi as well, he will drop into Kamo Gaseki and transform into the cosmic egg, forcing a rebirth of the universe, with Krishna and his compatriots at the center. When confronted on the topmost floor of the cosmic egg, he will fuse Flynn with himself and become Vishnu Flynn as a last ditch attempt to defeat Nanashi. If Nanashi accepts Dagda's offer, the destruction of the entity will kill Flynn and Nanashi will kill Krishna using Masakado's blade. Dagda will then revive Flynn as Nanashi's godslayer alongside a human partner killed by either Shesha or Nanashi himself. Albeit, both allies will become deranged and maddened puppets of Dagda and Nanashi. However, if Nanashi rejects Dagda's deal instead, Flynn will survive the impact and kill Krishna. He then joins Nanashi afterwards with his sanity intact. Regardless of this fate, Nanashi then may return to Kando no Yashiro to the place where Krishna was first sealed and talk to the Ark where he is sealed. Seeing him and Nanashi have the same goal, he will join them and become available for fusion. Now, let's discuss the design of Vishnu Flynn in Apocalypse. Regarding the Vishnu Flynn design, in Dory's words, the form of Flynn absorbed by Krishna different from the usual Finn design. This design is also originally from this game, so I had to reflect elements of both Vishnu and Flynn. I also base it on the Vishnu side of the Trimurti, or the Triple Supreme Deity in Hinduism typically formed from Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and included elements of all three gods. Since he is on the offensive, Vishnu becomes the dominant side, leading to his dark color. The swords are glowing red because they're based on the original details of the samurai design. In Megabi Ivan Roku Persona, 
Vishnu is the ultimate persona of the Emperor Arcana at level 86. Obtaining Vishnu requires fusing all the spell cards of Ganharva and Yaxini with the Avatar Totem, which is received after obtaining all 142 spell cards. Now regarding his design, in Kazuma Kaniko's words, he originally has so many different shapes that designing him was very enjoyable. The one that appears in Shin Megami Tensei is named Vishnu, but the image is actually that of Krishna, and I want you to compare him to Krishna himself, who appears as a guardian in Shin Megami Tensei. His appearance changes quite a lot in Persona, but on the other hand, the factor of change itself is a characteristic of this series, so I drew him as a so-called Persona King. Persona's demon fusions also have a common concept of the obvious hero figure, but at the same time, I also included in Vishnu's design a little the image from the swan from Swan Lake. In Soul Hackers, Vishnu is necessary in order to fuse Zed into the hero Rama. He's also used in the extra dungeon battle with Kyoji Kuzunoa. To be exact, the sustenance and destruction dungeon is the area where the hero is constantly floating up and down, which is needed to cross over fences that block his path. There are also turntables which sometimes warps him across this dungeon. It should also be noted that there are two different bosses to be encountered, although only one boss is needed to be defeated. In the northwestern corner, Shiva is fought, who condemns humanity's arrogance. In the southeastern most room, Vishnu appears and battles the protagonist. In Persona 3 FES, Vishnu is the second most powerful persona of the Sun Arcana, next to Asura. With the addition of the weapon fusion in FES, he can be fused with any kind of Neho weapon to obtain Sarnga, Vishnu's bow. It has an attack value of 400 and a hit rate of 90. His heart item is a chakra ring, which halves the cost of spells for the character who equips it. As you can see, it is very beneficial to obtain Vishnu in this game, as they are both quite powerful and the items are worth the time spent to get them. In Persona 5, Vishnu is the second to last persona of the Full Arcana, and can be obtained through fusion in the Velvet Room after the Full Arcana Confident has been completed. This requires that the protagonist be completely on the path of the true ending, and can only be fused in the Kulipoth world on a first playthrough. Vishnu is also the only source of the Vacuum Wave skill in the game, and one of three personas to learn the right gun skill. Vishnu is also one of three personas to learn Ali Dance, Repel Fire, and Wind Amp passive skills. When itemized through the Electric Chair Execution, Vishnu yields the Riot Gun skill card. Again, similar case here as in Persona 3, Vishnu is very much worth the time investment to obtain this demon for the previously mentioned skills. In Digital Devil Saga, Avatar Turner 2, Vishnu appears as an optional boss in room opposite that of Shiva's. To meet with Vishnu, the Embryon must first prove their worth to his avatar Narasimha and obtain the sword. Upon meeting Seraph, Vishnu states that it has been a while since the Dharma, or Righteousness, has vanished from people's hearts and has been replaced by Adharma, or wickedness, as it has now. He claims that he must cleanse this impurity by destroying Seraph and the others, and the only way to change his mind is for them to show the strength of their Dharma. During the battle, Vishnu's resistances will shift around each turn unannounced. He will shift to an elemental resistance to counter the last elemental attack used on him. If you use an almighty attack, it may prompt him to use Chatterbuja during both of his turns. Once his HP is low, he will cease shifting between elemental resistances and focus on using Rage, Chatterbuja, Vanity, and Rakunda Makakaja spells. Defeating him gives the party Pandemonium Rounds, which have an attack power of 300, which is the strongest in the game, and infuses the Nandaka with his power, unlocking the God of Light Mantra. After Vishnu's defeat, Seraph can open the chest in the room which houses the Aura Ring, which provides a plus 20 to all stats. So as you can see, it's definitely worth it to explore this battle and to get these items. It'll definitely help you on your journey in DDS too. One nice piece I'd like to discuss is, how does Vishnu's moveset align to what he would do in the lore? The answer? As you can see from the screenshot, not only are they an extremely powerful demon to begin with, but you're looking at a demon that can carry some of the strongest physical skills, but also the highest level buff and debuff skills, as well as the strongest light, dark, and elemental attacks. So, in my opinion, this demon very well aligns their strengths from a lore perspective, making it a must-have demon in any playthrough. Well guys, that concludes the video on Vishnu. I hope you're able to take away a lot from this video, and you not only learned about how essential Vishnu is to Hindu mythology, but also how significant they've been in Shin Megami Tensei. If you've enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Star Soldier 17, out.